All right, welcome to episode six of, well, my favorite podcast online. Uh, I might be a little bit biased, but it's What Are You Playing? Um, And I have brought back Jesse White. This is your third time on my show. I know, and I'm going to be on the next one, too. You might as well just make me a permanent member. Uh, It's probably going to (laughs) happen. Uh, whether whether the people want it or not, let's be real. Nobody's listening. <laughs> I literally do this show just to entertain myself. Um, but yes, welcome back. This is episode six, but this is the third time Jesse White's been on it. And as he was saying, I've already got plans for him and another person to join uh, next show because... This episode was actually supposed to be Hellblade 2, and we were going to do a spoiler cast. I'm going to actually delay that so we can add another person since Jesse and I have both completed the game, but we want to wait for at least one more. I might see if there's even another person. We'll see. Um, But we will uh, release that episode 7. It will be a Hellblade spoiler cast. We'll dive in all things, I say both Hellblade 1 and 2, but today and on this recording, I still want to talk Hellblade uh, too. But before we jump into it, I know, and I said this last episode, so I'm kind of just, I guess I'm destroying my, my own rules for my own podcast. <laughs> but as news comes out, I get excited about stuff. So last show, we talked Xbox. I thought that was a great conversation, by the way. Um, I think an hour and a half of the show was talking Xbox. Yep. Um, but like I said, I think that was a good conversation that we had with you, me, and Gaston. Uh, but today, I just real quick want to talk about, because I know you're also a big fan, Dragon Age Dreadwolf. There is more and more information coming out that's pointing to a November 2024 release. Still how, skeptical. how skeptical slash excited are you for this to actually happen? If that really does happen, that will be a day one buy for me. And I, I don't I don't go day one on a lot of games, but that's one that would definitely be there. Dragon Age, it's definitely a top three favorite RPG series ever for me. Yeah. It's yeah, that that's gonna be very high. And especially considering they've a, they've seemingly abandoned any of that live service nonsense that they yeah. were talking about at one point. I'm back on board. Yeah, if this game comes out this year, we're talking about 10 years since the last game came out. Yeah. Which is insane, especially since the game we're about ready to talk about. People were whining about what it was for seven years. Granted, I understand Dragon Age will be a bigger game. But the point is, is 10 years is insane for a development of game. It was a very rocky development. At one point, even I got a little nervous that I was like, am I never going to see a Dragon Age game again because of the first portion of it was we're going to make it with with a live service. And then they eventually cut that and kind of just rebooted everything. Plus, Bioware and EA have gone through a lot of leadership changes. That was another thing I was nervous about. Some of the key members of the dragon age team left uh which i don't like to see it's just like the way i would describe it for those who don't really follow bioware and their stuff that much i'm a huge bioware fan i would have to say i probably still would say they're my favorite developer of all time that's all time not currently because they don't really do much but of all time they have all my classic games that i'm like that if i want to replay a classic i usually go back to a bioware game that being said when they were sold off to ea that's when they started dying for me because they lost the two i believe their brothers that were in leadership um that i was huge fans of and then once they come back for for a hot minute and then leave again i think that's the mass effect side that's um Uh... I know who you're talking about. I'm forgetting Casey, Casey Hudson. Yeah, yeah. And he was part of like the coder stuff, um, yes. and Mass Effect and all that. But no, Casey came back, left. But I'm talking about the is it the Wachowski? It's not the Wachowski brothers. No, that's, that's the Matrix, Matrix buddy. The, and they're Wachowski sisters. <laughs> um, <laughs> but 
It's I don't I don't remember. They're they're the two doctors. I don't think they're brothers actually. Now I think I think I know who you're talking about. I just can't remember their names. Yeah, Yeah, they were they were the owners of Bioware, and under them, Bioware was amazing. Then they sold all their stuff to EA, and then they jumped ship. And when that happened, and I don't blame EA for everything, but I think you could see the importance of leadership when things change like that. But anyways, I just wanted to talk Dragon Age because. I saw another video and it just everybody's starting to talk and they're like, hey, at Summer Game Fest, which is June 7th. So I'm recording on May 28th. So we're talking in 10 days. We could get not only an announcement with like a release date, but a lot of gameplay footage and stuff like that. Um, I'm, and I'm then, curious to see what they really do with Dragon Age because, as you know, every single Dragon Age game has been vastly different from the other from previous ones. Each one has been a completely unique experience. So I'm curious true. to see if they do that again with Dreadwolf or, or if or if they lean into that Inquisition style gameplay again. And I think it's part of it is because they're always changing because they're always um, <laughs> trying to stay relevant and current and i think they've missed the mark sometimes like for instance a lot of people love dragon age origins that was very close to how coder played um not really that much different so people love that i would say if they were to make a dragon age game that mirrored that gameplay wise you would definitely it would not appeal to the masses i wouldn't personally mind but it wouldn't appeal to the masses so then dragon age 2 comes out and it's definitely more action based, ultra streamlined. That turn, yeah, and that turned off a lot of people. And then the third one, Inquisitions, felt like almost like Diablo, with if you want to, you can play it more tactical and kind of go back to its roots with how the original played, um, where you can basically slow things down and make your decisions and do that type of stuff, be a little more tactical. But it was definitely, I because I recently booted it up. If you play like a rogue character, it feels like Diablo. It's just uh, like the entire time. Um, but very, very fun game. I'm with you. Uh, I'm day one on almost everything. So that's that's not a thing. But like for me, Dragon Age, the franchise is top tier. It's like one of my most beloved franchises. So. I'm yeah, I can't think of another excited. game that's announced that's even announced that would top Dragon Age for me. No, it's that's it that's would, got a it chance would surpass for every, Yeah, yeah. If it really does come out 2024, it's going to surpass everything. I think yeah. the only thing I can think of off the top of my mind that I was like super stoked for was Final Fantasy VII um, Part Two, the remake Part Two. But I li- I liked it a lot but not as much as I I had hyped it up for. It was a bit of a letdown for me personally. I thoroughly enjoyed it, but there was too much fat on it. Some of those mini games. That's how I would describe it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's not a game where I was like, hey, I beat it. I want to play it again, which I do a lot. I don't always play them back to back all the way through, but I'll at least jump in and start playing. That one, I was like, I'm done, and I'm done. So I will I might, eventually play it again, but I'm going to skip back, a lot but, of the side content. Oh yeah, I will definitely, uh, I will definitely come back, but I it will be, I will skip as much as I can. Yeah, uh, whatever's possible. All right, so let's jump into the meat of what this show is. Again, the main game that we're talking about is in the background of our uh, cameras, and that's Sinuous Sagas Hellblade Two. Um, that word, that naming convention is kind of rough, though. Yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it. That's why I just usually just call it Hellboy too, and yeah. probably for the rest of the show I will. But before we jump into that game, I thought it would be fun to talk to you about it because you and I know each other pretty well. We've talked about it in previous shows. Uh, we chat all the time, almost every day through uh, Facebook Messenger. So I thought it would be fun to start the show before we jump into Hellblade with. What's your favorite Ninja Theory game? There's only two options, really. You you can't pick Hellblade because it sucks. Um, you have to pick either <laughs> Heavenly Sword or Enslaved Odyssey to the West. Those are the only uh, answers I'll accept. 
<laughs> well, given those very strict guidelines, <laughs> I would probably go enslaved. Odyssey, Odyssey of the West. Okay. All right. So give me your actual answer. Is it Hellblade or is it another game? Yeah, it would be it would be the first Hellblade game. Okay. All right. And second one did not surpass the first one in your opinion. Okay. And no, we'll I talk mean, about that. Further. It's really close, but it's not there. All right. We'll definitely talk about that because I'll have you compare them. Um, all right. So for me, I think in the chat I said enslaved. It's really hard because here's the reason why. Because, by the way, and Jesse knows this, but listeners probably don't. Before Hellblade came out, I was a huge Ninja Theory uh, developer fan. Shout out um, to DMC, by the way. That's what I was going to say. Because their first three main releases were top tier for me. I liked Heavenly Sword. I loved Enslaved. And I loved DMC. Um, the, out of all three of those, I want to say Heavenly Sword's my favorite. But here's why I'm having trouble saying it. My memories of it are I like the protagonist, which, by the way, they love red hair pr- protagonists, apparently. Um, I love the protagonist. And I love, like, in theory, what they were trying to do. I don't feel like their execution was that amazing. Like, I struggled getting through that game. And even when I came back to it, because I still have a PS3, and I came back to it whatever year I beat Demon Souls. So probably, like, four or five years ago. So it's a little bit ago, but not, like, forever ago. Because we're talking about a 2007 game. So we're talking about a 17-year-old game. Um and when I came back, to it, I was like, this is really rough. This is really rough. So I'm going to go ahead and say uh, Enslaved. Not that it's not rough. I, play it rough. I played it on PC. It's pretty rough, too. Um, Hold up any better than Heavenly Sword did? I think so because of the gimmick bullcrap that, if you remember, Heavenly Sword was doing all the gimmick crap from the PS3. Yeah. Um, so that's not in Enslaved. So I'm going to give Enslaved the nod but just know that heavenly sword would have if it didn't have all the gimmick crap and some of the bs with the gameplay as far as the story they were telling the characters the aesthetic i would pick heavenly sword all day every day do you happen to know if either of those are backwards compatible i don't think enslaved i think you can play i would have to check yeah, I couldn't. I wasn't sure, but Enslaved might, is one I'd go back to, to be honest. I think you can play it on Xbox. Heavenly Sword, I had to play it on PS3. I don't think it's part of any like premium service or anything on PlayStation. Um, and then I don't think Enslaved is on PlayStation I, no, either. So. You would have to play it on the PS3. Um, but Enslaved might be on the Xbox backwards compatible compatible list i wouldn't count on it but it might be yeah um, because i would think that i would have tried it if it was because there was a phase where i was doing that i was going through all the old games yeah i did that uh, at one point too all right let's actually jump into hellblade now <laughs> i would say since i would say since the first one is Probably one of your favorite games. What, where would you put it? Like top five, top ten, top one? It's definitely not top one, but I it could sneak into top five. It's definitely top ten. Okay. So the reason I asked that is I was my first question is your hype level going into the second one. Very high. with with your love for the first one, but also you following the advertisement of the second one, which We've talked about this before, but again, I, I think it's cool to share this type of stuff with listeners. You and I both, I definitely followed the first one a lot. I didn't watch all the journals, but I watched I a lot. Because that was, again, pre-Hellblade, huge Ninja Theory fan. Huge Ninja Theory fan. So, and I'll talk about it in a minute, but I think I overhyped Hellblade. Hellblade 2... The hype was way, way less because I didn't like Hellblade, not even close to what you liked it. Um, in fact, I call it Hell Trash all the time. <laughs> Hell Trash. And my expectation, first of all, I wasn't planning on buying it. I really wasn't. I know I say that and then I buy everything. But I was like, I'm not going to buy it. I'll just play it on Game Pass. 
And then my brain did what it always does. It's like, dude, you can get it for 40. It's regularly 50. That's $10 savings. Do your pay in four. You pay $10 every two weeks. Why, why wouldn't you just own the game? I'm like, yeah, because I like to own things. And I was like, yeah, I'll just do that. I think it's worth $10 every two weeks out of my paycheck. I can do that. So I did buy it, but my hype level was extremely low. I did not follow much. I did follow it in the beginning when Xbox had bought out Ninja Theory. And here's where you and I might differ in how we saw things. I think I came back to reality, though. And again, we'll talk about it in a minute. But when they first were bought by Xbox, not that I think Microsoft and Xbox manages teams good, even before all the bullshit the last month that we've been experiencing, and we talked about on our last show where we don't like how they manage things, yeah. and we we elaborate on that a lot. I'm not going to go over it again. Even before that, I did not have the most confidence in Microsoft but there was also an excitement because I knew Hellblade was completely funded by fans. It was an indie project. And I was like, now you're bought out by one of the biggest corporations who's trying to beef up their lineup. So my brain did go originally to this is going to be bigger. This is going to be better. We might get a God of War. And to be honest... Again, we'll talk about what Hellblade ends up being. Why wouldn't Microsoft have done that? Maybe it's because of the plot of this. They don't feel like they can do something like that. They want to stick to what the first one is. But I was thinking when they first talked about it after the the purchase of the the studio, I was like, they have all the funding. They have more time because Microsoft even said we're going to give them time to beef this game up. So I was thinking this was going to be this big God of War-esque type game. Then over time, when they stopped talking about it as much, that's when my expectations started to lower. And Microsoft didn't come out and say, hey guys, this is a smaller game. But you could just tell by the way they started talking, even how Ninja Theory was talking less, some of the news that was coming out of the studio, that this was going to basically stick to what the first game was. And Jesse, I'll let you describe, if you were talking to a stranger who has n- no idea what we're talking about with Hellblade, how would you describe Hellblade, not the second one, Hellblade to that person? What would you say that game is? I would say it is a cinematic narrative experience. It's, it, is, it, it is a game. It has gameplay, but it is more of an experience than it is a game. I would agree. Um, I think also it gets harshly judged. And this is coming from a person that, again, called the first one hell trash, which because I have experienced the second one with different expectations actually makes me want to go back and play the first one. I don't know if I'll do it anytime soon, but I would like to. Because I firmly believe that my expectations were off. I've I've always said this on any podcast I've ever done. Just in life in general. I'm not even talking about video games now. Expectations in general can dictate your life. If you have unrealistic expectations in your life, whether it's video games, whether it's relationships, whether it's business, whatever it is, it can doom you. If you have realistic and um, educated expectations, it can change everything. And so the reason I share that is because I think I had unrealistic expectations of what I believed Hellblade, the first one, was going to be. I think after the first one came out and I was beyond pissed at... So just kind of describe to you what my experience was these are just memories because remember i played this seven years ago i played it at launch yeah i pre-ordered it i supported it right away i was super excited i played it on the ps4 is either the ps4 or ps4 pro um and so i was super excited to play experience that game and then when i got into it i was you know first session i was like okay that's pretty cool i like the atmosphere i like more serious toned games. I didn't have a problem with any of that. 
the issue came when it was it felt like and again i'm going by feelings and memory puzzle after puzzle yeah and then for me excuse me for me personally i found regular enemy combat to be fine boss combat to be annoying like there was several bosses that i and i don't remember how bad it was but i just remember being infuriated because There's, I think I was struggling to figure out the systems thoroughly. Yeah, there is one boss in the original Hellblade that's like this crow dude. I can't remember their names because they all have weird, yeah, weird names. But he's able to like teleport Flat. around yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. That boss fight is annoying. Yeah, the there's that one. I, I think, think there's okay. one in there. One like in a dark, dark cave. And you can't see them. You have to listen for them. Yeah, there's there is there's one boss that has zero combat where you're trying to navigate through this house and he's just like a fire dude that you're trying to escape from. It's basically an escape simulator. You're just trying to get through this maze before he catches you, basically. Sounds like that might have been the one I hated. Yeah. I can see that. There was no combat. The gameplay was minimal you're basically yeah. just following a path to get away from him yeah so there was a lot of things i found frustrating that when i i don't remember what i scored it i usually keep all my stuff but i think it's on one of my old computers and i never saved it i don't think i have anything from 2017 um i want to say i probably gave it a 6.5 or a 7 uh, which i thought before release, I thought it would be an 8.59 for me personally. Um, 6.5 or 7 is not a hated game, though. No. And Helltrash, by the way, for if you've listened to me long enough, you know I'm a jackass. I over-exaggerate <laughs> everything for comedic purposes. Um, but I'm pretty grounded in I don't think I'm everly, ever overly harsh on games. Or, if anything, I, I'm too too nice uh, because i just enjoy games but that game i just again by memory did not enjoy it uh, but i think there was still some things about it i just appreciated it. i did appreciate the story like i went back before we did this podcast and after i beat hellblade 2 i was like i want to i want to watch the story again like what what did i experience in the first one um and then I also recap the second one just to make sure I didn't miss anything because there's a lot of talking. There's a lot of things going on. And I'm like, I don't know. And I don't both know. Both games have pretty ambiguous endings. Yeah. They're not necessarily very clear on how they end those games. I know we're not going to spoilers right now, but yeah, I want to make sure I didn't say that because we're doing a spoiler cast in the next episode. Jesse and I are just talking about our feelings for this game we're not going to spoil any of the story. We're not going to spoil. I don't really think we're going to spoil anything. We're just going to tell you whether we liked it or not and what we liked about it and what we didn't like about it. Um, so yeah, so for me, just as a little bit of perspective, when I went into one, I watched every piece of media that was attached to that game. I watched all of the uh ninja theory uh diaries that they did dev diaries i watched all the previews from all the various outlets like when i was going into that game i knew exactly what that game was going to be and then mm -hmm. when i experienced it it exceeded even what i was expecting with the the way that senua's journey is the way the voices are that surround you with the I really kind of immersed myself in that experience and just blew me away. Still blows me away today. I think what the second one is kind of at a disadvantage with, okay. with me and probably with a lot of people is that that experience is no longer novel. It's not a new experience anymore. So going into Hellblade 2... I don't think it ever had a chance of exceeding what my expectations were because I knew what to expect. It was, and it was exactly what I expected it to be. They didn't really do anything above and beyond what they did in the first one in respect to the voices and her experience dealing with these mental health issues that she's having. 
it's basically a continuation of that experience. So when I when I got into the first, the second one, I still really really love it, but I think what's holding it back and making it so that the first one is still my favorite is that that first one was such a novel new experience. I had never experienced a game like that before. That's good. Actually, that kind of ties into where I was going to go next. And that is, as far as comparing one verse two, do you, and you can speak freely on here, but obviously I'm going to press us to be, to not just state it, but also like give us, uh, give your thoughts a little bit deeper than just saying it. But do you think when you look at the Metacritic for one and you look at the Metacritic for two, which they're literally 81s. Yeah, they're both the exact same. There is an Xbox bias because, and here's why I say this for those who are listening, that maybe you're not in gaming uh, pages and stuff like that. For me, in my personal experience, I'm seeing a lot more negative um, posts, comments, articles youtube videos so this is outside of just like people i know these are like professional media people that are kind of down on the second game yet it literally has this same exact metacritic which ties into what you just said and i would 100 percent agree and here's the here's the deal to me there's not much difference between one and two as far as, like, the experience. The only major difference is what you just said. There's two, actually. One, for you, it was this first one was the first time seeing it, the first time experiencing it, and the second one could not exceed it. Now, part of why they didn't exceed it is, and this is my opinion, you don't have to agree with me, is, they simply just didn't go above and beyond what they did in the first one. They kind of played it safe. But where I do think it's different and what they really pushed into, which matters to me, is the graphical experience. Like, for those who don't know, you're play- you played on Xbox Series X, correct? Correct. Okay. And I played on my 4090 PC. I think that's the only one I played on. Yes. I played on my 4090 PC. I played half the game in 4K, completely ultra, everything jacked out, running at about 100 to 120 frames per second. I then, the second half of the game, switched it to 8K. I did have to mess with the settings. This is a heavy hitting game, by the way, for those who don't know. I had to mess with the settings but I still was running at at about 50 frames per second. uh, And I was keeping my DLSS at quality level because I don't like to drop it. I like quality basically means almost native. If the people who don't know how this stuff works, anything under quality, now you're getting into, it's not really like the image quality is really not what you think. Like it's not really 8k. Um, And, The reason I share that is not the flex on, well, my system's so cool. It's... There's a bit of that. A little bit of a flex, but, (laughs) dude, I was literally in awe the entire time I played this game. And you combine that with, I didn't have, and we'll dive into this a little bit deeper, so I'm not going to elaborate too much. I didn't have my frustrations that I had from the first one, which makes me go, okay, well, the first one's seven years ago, Derek. You were definitely a better gamer, and you know what the games are now. Maybe if you went back, your opinion would change, and you would up the score for the first one because you'd be like, hey, I know what it is. It's not what it's not like the previous Ninja Theory games. With all the ones we were talking about before, it's nothing like them. Yeah. Um, and I think I would appreciate what they're doing more because I can go into it going, I'm not expecting an action packed third person God of War style game. I'm more looking for a melee, the order 1886 experience, which I love. 
I know it got crapped on by lots of reviewers. I thoroughly enjoyed the Order 1886. But, dude, if Sony... There's like maybe a couple franchises I would put ahead of it, like Twisted Metal. But if Sony was like, Derek, the next franchise we're going to bring back is completely up to you. I'm telling you, 1886 would be very, very high up there. Yeah, it would Especially be with the way the game left off. And I was like, it left off with a cliffhanger. It had such a good story. It wasn't perfect. It, did, it Objectively, it was not perfect. I think I gave it an 8. And I platinum it and beat it like four times. That's so, another game that was rough with reviews, though, wasn't it? Yeah. I don't remember what the Metacritic was. I think it was in the 60s, which I can look it up and I will when I stop talking. But, like, it was more mixed. And that's kind of what I was talking about with this one. By the way, I went and looked at the Metacritic for Hellblade 2. There's only one really, really low score. Everybody else, the lowest you go is 6. There's one score that was like a 45 unless it's been updated since a couple of days ago. And I did look at that guy's review and honestly, he was he wanted a different game. He was just complaining for the sake of complaining, um, which I don't understand because, like I said, it it, it played just like the first one. It was telling. I don't, see, I, what I don't understand is I don't I don't know what these people were expecting. I, I don't know. It just it, it, everything that I had consumed leading up to Hellblade Two never led me to believe that this was going to be a high action God of War kind of experience. It always, I always believed it was going to be more Hellblade, and that's exactly what it was. Which, I mean, the price point should have given that away too. I mean, yes, it, it's funny because we make fun of them all the time in our group, uh, Dreamcast guy. <laughs> and this idiot gave the first Hellblade a 9 out of 10 when it was on the PlayStation, exclusive on the PlayStation. He gave Hellblade 2 a 4 out of 10. It dropped 5 points. And yeah, you can go opinions, opinions, but dude, I played both of them. You cannot tell me that the second one is a 5-point drop-off from the first one's experience. Unless not. it ties back to what I said originally, you had unrealistic expectations. You expected something it was never going to be, and that's your fault. And that's why I said I gave the first one lower score because I truly believe I was expecting a traditional Ninja Theory game. And if you go back and play Ninja Theory stuff, we, we've talked about it. Like Some of them are rough or whatever, but they're always experimenting. That's yes. the thing I didn't mention. They don't just copy and paste. Every they one of their just... games are different from each other. Exactly. They don't just do the same thing. In fact, th these two games would be the closest to them doing the same thing. But before somebody doesn't realize, this is also, I believe, the first game that they've done that was a sequel. They've never done a sequel. Done another one. I don't yeah. think they've ever done a sequel of any of their other original IPs. Um. So this is their first time going, okay. And there was a lot of changes within leadership in the studio, too, that I think impacted. I do think they had an, they envisioned this game being a little bit bigger. I can't confirm that. Um, maybe but originally, I, like early, early in development, maybe. Yeah. But the last several years, I never got that impression. Yeah. And then once the price point came out, I knew this was, I don't want to say it's double A. It's a triple A presentation, but as far as like length, how much of the game of a game it is, it's not I mean, very triple A. But, but I would push back on that a little bit because it was the order eighteen eighty six double A gameplay wise. It depends. Like this is where you're like getting into not you, but like. Where what's what's double A and what's triple A when it comes to like how much of the game, like for instance, I don't play a Telltale game and go these are triple A experiences. Why? I think story wise and acting and dialogues all triple A top tier stuff, but gameplay wise, no. It's but even it's, visually they're not. Yeah, so that's why I said presentation and visually and even story and voice acting. Holy shit! And the music and Hellblade games are 
outstanding. So everything is like triple A, like the experience. But as far as being a game, no, I don't feel like I'm paying for a triple A experience, which is why I believe they charge fifty dollars. I think if this game was twenty to thirty hours long, we, it's not fifty dollars. They go, no, it's a full triple A experience. It I think they knew the they were. Game. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. So it's it's for me, it's not double A, but it's not triple A. It's kind of like its own thing. I, I watched some guy, uh, Luke Stevens. I watched like a small clip of him, and he was saying it's not even double A. He was basically saying it was beneath that. And that they shouldn't have charged fifty dollars, and Which I was is like, "Ludicrous!" I'm like, I don't agree with that because I did. You cannot compare this game to all other games. That's the problem. Is too many people are going, this game doesn't do this, this, this compared to this game, right? So therefore, they shouldn't be able to charge so, so, and so. But where's the checklist that says all these games don't do what Hellblades? Two's doing at this level, this level, and this level. Because I'm sorry, again, I'm going to say it, and it's not a flex. If you see what I saw on that screen uh, with my setup, and again, even Xbox Series X is very, very good. There's no other game presenting like this game is presenting. There's no visually or fide- auditory. Visually, auditorial, um, music. Everything. I would even everything. Like the dialogue's good. Uh, I f- I felt like the story was decent. Again, we'll dive into that in a second. But I do think this game mirrors the first one a lot. No, it can't pull off the magic, whatever. As far as because also the first one's like her story. You don't know her. You don't know anything. It's complete mystery. We know her. She's no longer a mystery. So the impact of her having voices in her head. Not not as significant. Right. right? So it, it's obviously it would have had the the only thing I would critique it on because I didn't give this game a 10 out of 10. The only thing I would critique it on is I do wish they would have pushed it a little bit more with the combat. I'm not saying you have to have more combat. I wasn't. I wasn't like I'm seeing a, a, a lot of other people. Posting saying it's a walking sim. A, I don't feel like it's a walking sim. B, I also don't feel like I was like they need to have more combat. I just wish that when they had the combat, there would have been more depth to it. But I also want to say that I appreciate the combat the way they did it. And here's why it's a cinematic experience. So if you watch, like if you've experienced the game and you've played it, all of the gameplay parts, like the combat parts, are extremely cinematic. Yeah. Extremely cinematic. It's like one big like action scene from like a triple A or not triple A, but from like a big box office movie. No, it doesn't have set pieces where you're sliding down rocks. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the way it's all animated and how it's connected, especially the last before the last boss fight when you're fighting a bunch of enemies with some other people the way it's done reminds me of like a marvel's movie where it's all interconnected and you're playing off each character and you're running into them and you're saving them and they're saving you and it's all like a dance what and what blew me away with this whole cinematic experience that hellblade was is like even in that first boss fight that you fight on the beach with uh the dude that eventually ends up kind of walking with you is mm-hmm. uh you can actually see their facial expressions. Like you're in the midst of battle fighting this person and you can see realistic, like on uh, fully voiced body language, facial expressions that are believable. And I have like never seen that in a game before. No, Other games have tried it. It's I've never seen it. You probably have thought this in our younger days, like when you were playing games. I can't wait until games look like they're cutscenes. This game literally went, we are just a cutscene. The entire game, yeah. uh, we look like our cutscenes. 
Like nothing transitions. That's another yeah, thing. Everything I is in game. Everything is in game. Everything is in game. So every talking moment, story moment looks exactly like uh the combat moments or the walking right. around or exploring or the puzzles. Everything is the same. And dude, there's a part kind of towards the end where they're doing what I would would be describe as their cutscene. And there's a part where it just pans out and then does like a quick camera over a vista of like mountains and stuff and i was just you could tell it was flowing at like 60 frames per second because this is again a cutscene. uh and i was just like this is gorgeous dude this is breathtaking it almost so, is real yeah so for me this was a better experience for me enough to go maybe i should go back to the first one and give the first one a shot but uh, to go back to my question, and I did deviate from it, and I want you to answer too, and then elaborate. Do I think there's an Xbox bias? I do. I, I've always believed there is one. I'm not saying it's not Xbox's fault because, I mean, we just talked about it two weeks ago. That's yeah. kind of their fault. Like they do a lot of dipshit stuff. But I just some of it's it's crazy how you can actually literally take two games. They're almost identical. I'm okay if you score the second one lower because maybe you're in the category because everybody has opinions where you're like, okay, I get it. The first one was good, but you didn't do anything to improve it in combat and even length or anything like that. In the second one, you had a bigger budget, you had more time. You should have done better. Okay, I'll give you that. Drop the Drop it a point or so. But to have it where you're literally hearing people say, it's trash. It's not good. It's walking. I was blown sin. away by some of the reviews just because they would give the first one a nine out of ten or even a ten out of ten with some of these reviewers, and then with the second one, it's a six out of ten. Yeah, it's like That's I don't. What I'm talking. I don't understand that jump because Hellblade Two, if I'm being completely honest, is a step up from the first one in almost every way. Exactly. If you compare it to the first one and you simply go, does it do the first one better? I would agree with you. If your expectations is it should do what it did in the first one better, plus add more stuff, which you created in your own head, then that's where I think you're running into, well, what is your expectations? And you can't fight people on it and, and, unless you just say, but you weren't paying attention. They don't want to hear that. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. They had seven years. They had a bigger budget. This is Microsoft failing. So, do I think there is a stigma because it's under an Xbox umbrella? Yes. Am I happy? Let me say this because I haven't said this. The fact that it's tied on Metacritic at eighty-one means that, in general, most reviewers are not the people we're talking about. Right. It's it's these YouTube personalities, it's regular gamer gamers and groups, which we all know a lot of them are biased. Um, but I do think it's just odd that when it came out on PlayStation, and again, I'm just going based off seven years of memory. I just remember people praising the hell out of it. And then now the second one comes out and it's like, Xbox doesn't have games. This is what Xbox does. This is bad. This is a bad release. This is not the big, big hitter that they should have released um and i just really don't think that's what it was i think in the beginning sure you could have thought that i did but as the news came out as the price point dropped as the advertisement came out if you were paying attention at all that's not what it was and i think if you compare it to the first one it is leaps and bounds better in a lot of areas as far as graphics even sound just the cinematics did you, uh, just out of curiosity, did you go back and play any of the first one just to see how the combat yeah. and stuff was? Yeah. The combat is an evolution in the second one. I'm not saying it's super deep or anything, yeah. but the first one was basically a button masher. Where yeah. the second one, you actually do need to dodge and block and mm -hmm. do that. I'm not saying it's like difficult or deep. But they did add levels to the second one that just simply don't exist in the first one. I need to play it more. I did only get to... So the first, like, 20 minutes is literally just 
walking. Senua in a canoe. In a canoe. Yeah, I'm talking yeah, about the first yeah. game. In a canoe, talking to herself, and then she walks for a while. And then I got to the first combat area, played it. I may have done a little after that, and then I was like, okay, I'll have to come back later because I hadn't beaten the second one yet when I did this. Yeah. And I was like, I need to beat the second one. Um, but I wanted, uh, there was a couple reasons why I wanted to see it. And this was on PC again. I have it on steam. Um, I wanted to see, I, I thought it was, I'm actually glad I went on there and played it because even though I know it's seven year old game, so it's not fair to compare it. It's a huge jump. And when it came out, uh, seven years ago, that was considered a very, very pretty game. So we're not talking about a half ass ugly game back then and now this one's gorgeous this was a good looking game seven years ago that's how big of a jump this is i talk about how good looking games are a lot but this game is actually making other games look ugly so i went and played dragon's dogma 2 a little after i beat hellblade 2 the same day and i was like yeah it's still good looking this is on my rig my pc rig so it's still good looking but man those cliffs sure don't have a lot of detail. That grass is <laughs> not very grassy looking. Like, unless you've experienced it, it looks real life. And so when you go to other games that are just games, it's a it game is, changer. It is a little unfair, though, to compare a hyper-focused narrative yeah. Very linear experience to an open world game. Oh, of course. I'm just saying. Do. Yeah. Of course. I don't expect it to. I do think we are headed in that future. That's why I wanted, when I bought my PC, I didn't want to hold back. Not only did I want 8K, but I wanted to be able to play games in Unreal Engine 4 or 5, which is hyper realistic. It's able to add levels of detail that Unreal Engine 4 couldn't do and still run games more efficiently, more optimized. So this is what this game is. I I know um, Lords of the Fallen was in Unreal Engine 5. It's not as pretty as this, obviously. But that game had levels of details that other Souls games couldn't do, and it's strictly because of the engine. So... That's what I'm saying is this game. No, I'm not going to say other games should look at it, but that is the future. It won't ever get to this level unless it's a smaller title with a triple A studio, which doesn't happen a lot of a lot of times, by the way. Usually, if you have a good, talented studio like a Ninja Theory, they're going to be put on a seventy dollar triple A experience assignment, right. and I think going forward that you, you will see that, or their team will get divided, and they'll be like one team makes smaller games, and another team makes their big triple A experiences. But I do think Microsoft's going to go in that direction. But the point I was saying is that this game is just next level, and it does change the way you look at other games because you're just like. No, I don't expect them to look like that right away, but I was like, holy crap. The future is bright when it comes to the level of detail, and this game is optimized very well. The fact that I can run it, again, it's not open world or anything, but at high settings and and run it at 4K or 8K at very high frames per second, with all that level of detail, that means it's optimized extremely well. Um, I look forward to exactly what you're talking about, where other games are able to replicate or improve on what Hellblade has done with their ability to have the the body inflections and the facial expressions and all that stuff in combat and in fluid action sequences where usually that stuff is just carbon copy exactly it, it's and it going could to be change, very cool it could change the way we play games where it could get so detailed where they might be able to eliminate life bars in games and stuff like that where you can see by the way the character deteriorates or maybe their facial expressions or maybe they'll have the character say something it could change a lot of things for the future with all this level of detail in, in the animation. That's the other thing we didn't really talk about, other than saying the graphics are amazing. But, like, 
when Senua's face is on the camera and she's talking, it's like a real person's talking to you. All her, I mean, her it basically eye movement, is. It is. It's her, and nothing's downgraded. It's just visually stunning, and you're getting to see all of that. And again, normally, for most games nowadays, that is a cutscene. I'm talking this is in-game engine where this is all happening. That's crazy. And even in cutscenes, some of those facial expressions would look janky. Mm-hmm. They don't have the, the, the quality that it. this is. This yeah. is next level tech. So let me, to close things out with, with this game, overall, we both liked it. I scored it. I gave it an 8 out of 10. Uh, I would give it a I 9 found. out of 10. Okay. And the first one you gave... Uh, I would give it a, a full 10 out of 10. Okay. So it drops a point. So my 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 last thing for this is what were your without spoiling it what was your overall thoughts on the story i actually think the story was pretty strong i don't think it was as strong as the first game Mm -hmm. but the other characters that are introduced i think are all strong likable characters with their own motivations and uh Mm -hmm. what they want to accomplish their own story arcs also it's not just about Senua anymore. She's actually influencing other people. Mm-hmm. I think that's very cool. This whole story about trying to go and end this slave trade, which is what... Well, I mean, when you land in the very beginning, I don't think it's a spoiler. That's why she's there, is to, yeah. to end this slave trade that's taking her people, basically. The Northmen from the first game. Yes. It's good. It's really good. I, I like, but I, like I think it. what drags it down slightly is just that novelty. It's that I, there, I don't know if there was any way they could be expected to beat the first game. Only thing I would say that I felt like they could have done again. I don't know if this is a budget Microsoft thing or you know, which I would imagine. Hey guys, seven years, come on. But it. I would agree with you. I liked the companions and the characters. They weren't in it in the game enough. And some of them were rushed. I liked without spoiling it. I'll spoil it on the next show. Um, I like how some of the characters were tied to how the game ended. And I thought that was really well done to actually. I saw people complaining about how the story ended. I actually liked it. There's a little bit of a twist that I was like, oh, that's cool. I like that. Um, that I wasn't expecting. I, I can't explain it here. But um, but I also felt like it was a little rush where I was just like, hey, there's a certain character you meet. She's pretty cool. And you meet her and then the game's over. And I'm like, yeah, well, I, w- I wish we could have explored her and the other characters. Also, it's probably not going to happen but let me live in Fantasyville for a little bit. I would love it if these characters, if that's what her story becomes, her recruiting characters, and they built out an open world RPG, like action RPG with this gang or this crew. Um, I know it wouldn't happen, but I just think how cool of an evolution if they were like, Hey, we created these two smaller titles to introduce you to her, her companions, and now we're going to make a full-fledged action RPG open world triple A experience in this world. How freaking cool is that? You know, they can make the changes. It doesn't have to mirror like an ass- Assassin's Creed or anything like that. Make it their own thing. But how cool would that be? But overall, I ended up liking the story. I don't think the story has ever been an issue for both the games. Um, I think the games are just, contra- especially the second one, controversial because of length um, and the expectations of, hey, we want more combat. We want more of a AAA experience in those totally areas. I hearing that as, a, as an issue with the first game. No, it, it wasn't. I You would hear me complain about it in the first one because I was like, this combat's shit. You know, that was my opinion. I don't... It, and I don't think I'm like... I know somebody could be listening and be like, Derek, you're changing your opinion on the second one because it's an Xbox game. I promise you guys, 
Xbox is third on my list when it comes to consoles. I prefer my PC, I prefer PlayStation, and I prefer Nintendo over Xbox right now. Um, it really isn't that. I really think it's expectations. I think I really went into this game going, A, I was blown away by the graphics. I am shallow. <laughs> you put something pretty in front of me, that goes for girls too. You can give me the most annoying girl in the world, but if she's hot, I'll find a reason to like her. You give me the coolest girl in the world, and she's not hot, I'll find a reason not to like her. You know, that type of thing. So I'm very shallow when it comes to, like, graphics. But I really think I like the second one more because of expectations, where I was like, hey, I've heard everybody complain about this game, whereas the first one I heard everybody praising it. I'm expecting this to not be fun, and I expect me to bash it to Jesse and piss him off. And I actually kept quiet. I didn't bash the game, but I also didn't praise it in our chat. I just played through it. I said, I'm keep, I'm still playing it, still playing it. And then when I finished, I was like, it's an eight. It's not perfect, but it's definitely not. a. Fr- it was never frustrating. I should have said that, and I should, didn't say it earlier. I want to say that. As somebody who hates puzzles, there was only one time where I got lost on a puzzle. One of the water and, bubble ones. Yeah. And I was able to find it and figure it out without even needing to cheat, like go on YouTube. But it did take longer. In fact, it's funny. I literally had just said, this is annoying. I've got to look it up. And then I ran and ran into it. I was like, no, never mind. I don't need to look it up. Um, it was just getting to that point where I was starting to complain. Uh, but yeah, graphics, puzzles. Story and for me, even the combat were all good. I liked it all. The only part of the game that I thought dragged a little bit, and I won't, I'll go into it more in our next episode. But even though you actually play through this part in maybe 40 minutes, that whole cave sequence I felt dragged on too long. Crawling through corridors and yeah, doing a lot of nothing, kind of. It so wasn't balanced cave really well this. because that section, you even go outside for a little bit, but it's all like puzzle, like puzzle maze type stuff. And I don't feel like that's where I could see people complaining and I couldn't really fight them on it where it's like it's it felt heavy in that area. And then the towards the end of the game, it was like more talking, less puzzles more combat and then it just ended um and like i said i I don't want to say the ending felt rushed but it did it felt like they were like oh microsoft's getting mad at us we better just end it here did Um, end a bit abruptly yeah i i do wish they could have fleshed it out more i i think it's a legitimate complaint and like i said my overall experience and i'm going feelings based here was just i feel like this is an eight I don't I don't feel like it would be right to give it lower, but I also can't give it higher because I'm like, it's not a masterpiece to me. It's not something that I'm like, I'm going to come back and play it a gazillion times. But it definitely changed my feelings about the type of experience they were giving me to the point where I'm like, hey, I need to go back to one. And I might come back to one and go, nope, it's still frustrating. The puzzles are still annoying. Or I might be like, no, this is way easier. I was just being, I was just pitching a fit. <laughs> it wasn't what I wanted, and I pitched a fit, which definitely could be. All right, so we both liked it. For those who got through our hour conversation on it, it's a good game. It's worth checking out. If you have access to Game Pass, definitely worth that. Uh, if not, if you like to own your games like I do, do a deep sale. Buy it when it's 20 bucks. I think it's worth 20 bucks. Um, again, just go into it with uh, realistic expectations that it's not a walking simulator, but it's definitely more of a story-driven experience and adventure than it is about throwing a bunch of enemies at you for the sake of just throwing a bunch of enemies at you. Um, and I think you'll appreciate it more. So let's uh, talk about game number two before we move on to a couple other quick subjects that we'll go through i don't think this conversation will be as long because it's an older game but i have played about 12 hours of it and then i'm obviously curious to see 
what Jesse has played and his thoughts on it. But we're going to actually talk about Star Ocean, the Divine Force. Um, so I'll start off with how many hours in are you on this game? So I'm still early. I'm two to three hours in. I've reached the first. I'm just beyond the first like town, hub town that you've reached. Okay. I've got uh, the girl. I've got the girl, the guy, Ray. So it's like, what is it, Leticia or something like that? Ray or... Leticia like is that. not black, by the way, people. No, it, I, I don't think that name's right, but it's something similar to that. And then Albert, who's like the girl's like bodyguard. guardian, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it, that's my party right now. And well, we're... I think the most important question, besides like combat, graphics, story, is what do you think of Ray's hair? That's all that really matters. If 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 you don't it's appreciate very Ray's hair, it's like it's like our trailer trash JRPG, huh? I said our mutual friend Rob would love it. Oh, absolutely. In fact, we should have had Rob on the show just to talk about Ray's hair. We should have just posted a picture and be like, what's your thoughts? This is the only time you're allowed to talk. You're not allowed to talk during Hellblade. You can only talk to tell us what you what your thoughts on Ray from Star Ocean. Yeah, Ray's hair is god awful. It's uh <laughs> it's basically a blonde futuristic mullet. So it's just I don't I don't get what they're going there. Uh, what are you playing on? Are you playing on Xbox Series X? No, PlayStation 5. Okay, that's where I'm playing. I actually, truthfully, because I'll say this, I'm 12 hours in, I actually really enjoy this game. It's it, it's not a top-tier JRPG in any category. I think it has really cool exploration as far as how you move around the wor- open areas or open world. I also think the combat can be fun once you figure it out because there's a lot of combos. It's pretty quick. Like you can dodge in and out, shoot in, shoot out. Um, so I think the combat's a lot of fun. I actually think the story's good. The characters are overall pretty cool, except for dialogue and voice acting can be well, very Star Ocean. They're not. Yeah. They're not really well done. What's this your experience with the franchise? I'm trying to think if this is the first real Star Oceans I've played. This is the second one I've played, and the first one I played was apparently the worst of the series. Yeah, I bought other Star Ocean games on my PS3. I don't think I ever played them, played them. This is the first one I actually like dived in and actually played. I also bought the one that came out recently. That's the remaster, like, Pixel game. Yes. Yep. But I've only played, like, 30 minutes of it. Um, which that one's supposed to actually be amazing. It's like a nine out of ten. Lots of people loved it, and I think it's a remake of the second Star Oceans, which is considered the best one or whatever. Um, so th- I don't have a lot of experience with it. I've just always seen them on sale. Yeah, and I generally like JRPGs. So if I see one, uh, reviews generally good and they're decent, I'll usually support them and buy them. And I think that was why I bought this one. I bought it on sale a year ago, maybe a little bit more than a year ago. And I was like pleasantly surprised. I did my research before I bought it, so I knew most reviewers generally liked it. But I was actually surprised how much I was sticking with it. I did drop off of it. Um but I actually, because I knew you and I were talking about it, I was like, I should download it again. So I'm going to download it on my PS5. That's where I played it at. I think graphically, it's underwhelming. I think story... It's very JRPG. Yeah. Like, standard. Those those games are never graphical powerhouses. Unless you're like a Square Enix one. It's a, they're, they're more AAA as far as looks. Yeah. And presentation. It's this right one, in line with like a uh, Xenoblade or a Tales yeah. game. Exactly. It's right. In, except for the last Tales. I felt like the last Tales was actually really, really good looking game. Um, they really stepped up their, their game. And apparently it sold really well. 
So I do think presentation matters, not just to shallow people like me. Graphics and presentation matter to other gamers, even when all the ones that say it doesn't matter. I'm like, well, then go play your old consoles. Why are you buying new consoles? Go play your old ones. You haven't played every game from that. It's because you like the new experience. You like the new graphics. Graphics do matter. And this is the reason why pixel art is neat. Exactly. I would say this is mid when it comes to graphics. Yes, it's standard to what we're used to. But if somebody was like, I've never played these type of games before, it's very mid looking. Um, story is intriguing, especially as you dive in deeper. They there's more and more characters. There's more and thing, more stuff happening. It's a Are good, you, good, good game. Did you start it from Ray's perspective or from yes. the girl? So I did it from the girl's perspective because. I googled. I did a little bit of googling just to make sure I knew what I was doing. Like mm-hmm. I wanted to make sure I picked the right character to start with, and uh, it sounded to me like his is more like sci-fi Star Trek kind of perspective, where her perspective is more like high fantasy kind oh, of okay. perspective, and that perspective just interested me more. I'm curious if it's drastically different. That would be pretty awesome or if it's because they're they're together a lot i think they're together like almost the entire time they are but i think what the difference is is that from her perspective you go into this game you go into these situations and everything is new like all this technology that ray is bringing along is all new and stuff like that where you do it from his perspective and it's like common knowledge yeah. yeah yeah Yeah, it's it's a it's a decent game. If somebody's, I know it's on sale like right now, uh, especially with like Memorial Day. That's one of the games that got marked down physically and digitally. I would I would put it in the recommend category if I had to score it even without beating it. So that means it could go a little higher or lower depending on you know my how the rest of the experience plays out. But in my twelve thirteen hours. I would give it like a solid seven, uh, which is part of why I dropped off. It's not that it was bad. It was just like, yeah, I've got a gazillion other games. I'll play something better. But I did like what I played uh, enough that I always come back to it. Like I know because I'll, I'll every time I boot it up, I can see when the last time I played it and I come back and play it for like 30 minutes to an hour every couple of months. So there's, it's one of those games where it stays in my brain where it's like, you should come back to this. You need to come back. You should commit to it. So it's one of those games. I'm not saying I will, but a lot of times when it's like that, I eventually get to a point where I'm like, I'm going to beat it. And I just do it. I lock in and beat it. If I just forget about you, I forget about you. This is not one of them that's getting forgotten. So, and that's why I have two PS5s. I just downloaded on my second one. That's closer to me for work. So it might be one that I'm like, all right, well, while I'm working and I don't want to play a PC game, I'll just jump on and play some more Star Ocean. Yeah. So you'll have to I picked keep it up us for updated. thirty bucks, and even though I'm early in it, it's definitely got me wanting to go back to it. So just that alone tells me it's worth thirty bucks. Oh yeah, I think you'll like it, and you'll definitely, I think you'll beat it, and definitely beat it before me. Uh, but you'll have to keep me updated on on your thoughts on it. All right. So to close out the show, couple of uh, couple of things left. Real quick, I just want to ask this question. This won't be like a super long topic, but I was thinking about what's your favorite co-op game? Like games you just play with buddy. What would be your top few games that you're like? If if everybody was down to play this, this is what I'd want to play with them. I'm going to channel my inner X-Bot here and uh, say that Halo and Gears are probably two of my favorite co-op games. Being able to hop into Halo and run like Halo Infinite right now is a blast playing co-op. Gears is tailor-made for playing that game in Mm co-op. Those would be two of my highest. Um, I also do really enjoy playing games like Bloodborne in co-op i loathe and hate them when i'm playing them solo but playing them in co-op they're a blast well i told you if you ever see it for 
15 20 bucks and you have like your little rewards thing since you don't like to spend any money you have to buy it on ps5 though if you want to play with me you yeah. should buy lords of the fallen the new one and you can pretty much run the entire game co-op and i'm in new game plus and i'm halfway through i got stuck on a boss but that's another story for another time i beat the game i beat this boss easily but a new game plus apparently he's god mode because like they, they yeah they've tweaked the game a lot and so they changed all the boss fights they actually made them all harder because if you i'll just say this real quick if you played the game when it originally came out the bosses were all of them i don't even think i got stuck on one were easy like you could just go in and beat them first maybe second time maybe they catch you off guard right they weren't hard at all the levels were the bosses because they would they would heat seek missile you they always had like snipers and they never missed and then you would have like five six guys chasing you like it was you couldn't even explore the levels those were the bosses then they got all that feedback i wasn't the only one saying it. a bunch of other gamers were complaining about it so they updated it and they've done it to to be fair these developers have been amazing at patching this game because i played it on ps5 and beat it there but i also bought it on pc um and so it's downloaded on my pc and every almost every other day when i go on steam lords of the fallen has an update lords of the fallen has an update lords of the fallen has an update i'm like my god guys stop i'm gonna delete you just because you're making me download updates but they were constantly tweaking it and so they ended up tweaking the bosses to make them harder and tweaking the levels to make them where it's more like a bloodborne game where it's, yes it's challenging but you can explore you don't have to run for your life every five seconds just out of so, curiosity yeah um so i played the first lords of the fallen i'm this not gonna say i played it a lot because i got frustrated and wanted to burn that game but in comparison to the first game is it just more of the same or have they really tweaked it way better the 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 combat is at the level of a from soft game as far as okay let me say that because let me say this because that's not completely accurate that almost as far sounds as, like blasphemy yeah as far as feel goes how it feels like when you lock on an enemy and you're swinging all that and the movement it's from soft level of quality they've done an amazing job is it more it's of far, like a block and parry kind of game or a dodge around? Like uh, Bloodborne it's, up kind to, of game? it's up to you. I would say most people are going to play it block and parry and dodge uh, and not dodge, but block and parry slower. I actually, if you see my character, I ran almost the entire game with dual wielding a huge hammer and a huge sword. So I never block. I'm always dodging and I'm always double swinging and You'll see, like, if you and I ever co-op, you'll see my combo. It's extremely powerful. It's not super fast, but it's not super... It's fast enough that I can get those hits in, and when I hit you, I'm crushing you because my weapons are so heavy. Um, but I'm a quicker character as far as movements. I'm not blocking, really. Um, so you can play however you want, really. You decide. But what I was going to say, because I want to make sure people know, the lock-on system, unless they've completely fixed it, was a broken mess. So that's where it's not like FromSoft. Like, I know they've improved it, because when I went back and played it, it was improved, but it was still messed up, where it just will lock on to the wrong guy. Like, you'll have five enemies, and the one that's closest to you, it won't lock on to that one. You'll hit the lock-on button, and it'll go to the one to the far right, and I'm like, what are you doing, dude? He's hitting me. You moron. So I would get mad at it all the time. Um, anyways, good game, though, especially after they patched it. But uh, it's definitely one you it's built to play co-op. So it's a fun experience uh, for a, me. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to name one more. So as, yeah, go ahead. as probably my last one, that's like top tier co-op games would be Diablo. Just the okay. entire franchise. All right. OK, I could see that. Diablo 4 has been a, a really good experience for me, way more than I thought. I liked it at launch, but I've been really enjoying it, especially co-op. Um, so I would put that in there as a good, fun game to play with everybody. But my top ones are easily Rocket League, 
and which I don't play anymore. But yeah, it's I thought about be. Rocket League, but I just haven't played it in so long. I haven't played in probably a year, which is the longest I ever went since launch. But um, there's just too many memories not to include that in my one of my favorite co-op games. And then probably my current favorite is probably Destiny 2. Uh, and I'm really excited about the the new DLC, them closing it up. I think it's going to be a year of content, and then Destiny 2 is done. Um, so I'm excited about that because it's like, I love that game, but I'm ready for them to do whatever they're going to do next because they really need to change it. Excuse me, the formula of destiny because destiny the brand has been around for 10 years um destiny 2 has been around i believe seven years so they really need to change it up and uh, i'm excited to experience that and be done with it some um do you think they'll do destiny 3 or do you think they'll move on to something completely different I think they're going to do Destiny 3. I think they're just going to change everything. I think they're going to kind of reboot it. Maybe they won't call it Destiny 3. Maybe they'll call it Destiny something else uh, to kind of reboot it. But I think they'll reboot it where they're going to be able to, to be able to explain and start things completely different and not be just tied to, well, it's a Destiny game, so it has to be like this. They'll probably be able to explain some way they rebooted it so it can be a different experience or i'm hoping that's just me hoping um and then let's let's end it with this uh i like to end on what are you playing so besides the two games that we talked about are there any other games that you're currently playing um right now outside of those two yeah i've constantly got the elder scrolls online that i'm playing another huge expansion is releasing in june my girlfriend and I will both be buying that and investing tons of hours into it. At this point, if I'm being completely honest, I've put over 2,000 2, hours into ESO at this point. It's probably one of my most played games ever. Yeah. At this point. That's, that's like Rocket League numbers for me. Yeah. yeah. That's so, crazy. Yeah, that's just any time that, like, whenever I finish a game... I go play ESO. It's like my comfort food at this point. Well, that's that's. How is that not in your co-op games? It's hard because it, I have to admit I don't think of MMOs when I think of co-op games. Yeah. I generally think of like one to four yeah. players, but that's basically what an MMO is. So you're right. I should think of that. Do you one. always just play it with? With your girlfriend, or do you play it sometimes without her, and you just play alone and slash with randoms? Yeah, I never, ever, ever play with randoms, but I do play solo occasionally, and my uh, my son Cole also occasionally plays it, so he and I will play. But okay, I would say sixty percent of my time playing that game is with my girlfriend. Forty percent is solo or with my son. Okay, well that's that's not a bad percentage. I actually, uh, because we were chatting about it, I was like, I should probably download it. At least just, you know, give it a shot. I did buy it on PC. I originally bought, I told you, the $100 version when it launched on PS4. Didn't play it a lot. Didn't it like it. It wasn't good at launch anyway. It's very Fallout 76-ish in that way. Yeah, which I talked to you about. Fallout 76 is definitely a better experience now. Um if you ever see it on sale, I would highly recommend getting that. I think you would actually on Game like Pass. it. You should check that out with your girlfriend. If she's ever like, well, I'm kind of getting bored. And be like, you know what? Let's try Fallout, Fallout 76. I think you guys would like that. Um, anything else outside of that? Or is that, that wrap it up for you? I think that basically wraps it up. Okay. I will just throw out, uh, I've talked about this game before, so I'm not going to talk about it anymore, except for I'm kind of switching over, especially now that I beat Hellblade 2 and making my main Dragon's Dogma 2. Uh, I have definitely gotten further in that game, about 22, 23 hours in. The experience, not that it was ever bad, it just kind of was like, I wasn't feeling it as much as I wanted to. And, Keep in mind that was like it seemed like almost a disappointment. 
It was because like that game and Final Fantasy. Why am I forgetting the name of the Final Fantasy Rebirth? Were my two most hyped games. Rebirth was a little bit of a disappointment, but overall I still liked it. I think I ended up giving it a 9 out of 10. Dragon's Dogma 2 was good from the start. Like, as far as every time I would play it, I would enjoy it. But I wasn't, like, playing it. I would not play it that much. And I don't know why. I think I just wasn't in the mood because it is a very, like... It's not a tile a title that like holds your hand and points you to where you go. Yes, it has markers on the map most times where it wants you to go, but how to get there is very difficult and the journey there can be very frustrating. It's a, a long journey on most of them. Like literally the next main mission I'm doing now is to I think go fight a dragon and I'm like, "Oh god, guys." And it's like across the map like really and there's no fast traveling if you haven't explored the area and even the fast traveling for those who don't know how the system works is not like your typical open world game where you just go i want to go there because i've been there before click button and then you just load there it doesn't do that there's certain areas in the game that already have crystal ports there i believe that's what they're called and then you also get a crystal port that you can put in other locations you can pick it up too so you have to move it that you can fast travel to if you drop it there don't you need like certain items to be able to go to yes that was what i was going to say and then you have to use an item to fast travel so if you don't have that item even if there's a crystal port at the location you want to be at if you don't have the item it's a fairy stone you cannot travel there fast travel there so I actually how abundant used, is that item? Um, I think they're like ten thousand dollars to buy them, that's and pricey. that's pretty expensive. I think later in the game it's a little less expensive, but in the beginning, ten thousand dollars is a lot of money. Do you find um, them in the world very often? I don't think I found that many in the world. I just had three, and I forgot one of them was because I actually made a uh. Is a forfeiture of it? I forgot what it's called. It's not a real version of it. And I threw it in the sky to use it, and it was like, you didn't go anywhere. And I was like, oh, crap, I forgot I accidentally duplicated this item, and it's fake. Um, so I really only had two, and the last time I played, I used both of them. So I'm actually all out. Um, so hopefully I either find one soon, or I think I'm pretty low on money, because I spend a lot of money upgrading my character like upgrading the armor buying new weapons but i will say this i gotta give it praise once you figure out the combat and the the systems it is so much fun and if you can i i've talked a lot about perspective and what what's your your expectations going into the game i always tell people if you're gonna play this game You don't need to play it because you're trying to check off story missions and beat the game. You need to play it if you want to just chill out, relax, and go on an adventure like Lord of the Rings. And just, it's all about the journey, not about the destination. And that's kind of what flipped for me. Like, hey, Derek, you've gotten through all these other big hitters. Now you can come to this game and just enjoy the journey. And I'm enjoying it more. So it's definitely not a letdown as far as. I think the game's worse than the first one. It's it's the first one improved. They didn't do anything completely different. It It's kind of like what we talked about with Hellblade 2. Hellblade 2 is basically a better version of Hellblade, but they didn't change the formula. Dragon's Dogma 2 is a better version of Dragon's Dogma, but they didn't change the formula so at all. If you weren't all. big on the first one, you're probably not big on the second one. No, no. Um, but I'm I'm absolutely loving it now. And then the other two games I want to I definitely want to talk about because I think they're worth notating. I put in uh, about five hours into Unicorn Overlord on the Switch. You can buy it on the PS5. I think that's it. I think it's only on Switch and PS5. I don't think it's on. Well, I think it's on Xbox Series X. It's just not on PC. Um, so I think it's a console only game. It's 
really freaking good, like what better than I thought it was going to be. So it's it's a unique experience. So I, I to say it's just like a Fire Emblem is not completely accurate. But basically, it's got a really good story, by the way. So if you're really into stories and characters, then this is a game, game up your alley. But essentially, the way the gameplay works is you're you're creating these mini armies, so you unlock the ability to deploy more and more armies. And it's usually, like right now, I have access to six units, and all six of them can only have three characters in each unit. Now, as you go through the game, you get more stuff, you can upgrade more uh, characters in the unit. So I think you can get up to six because it's kind of on like a board and there's six slots. Um, So right now in all six of my units, I can only put three characters in each unit. And it's basically you recruit characters and a lot of them are in the story already. Here's the other thing that I liked about it is if you do side quests, so these aren't main level quests, you can unlock new characters in the side quests. Um, and they're unique characters. They all have stat bonuses. They all have their their little thing and their weapons and stuff like that. Um, you can upgrade them, upgrade their their armor, upgrade their weapons, buy new weapons, um, upgrade some of their stats and stuff like that as they level up. But essentially, what you do is you go from you're kind of just trying to take over areas. But you're not playing the game. So here's what I mean. Like once you decide to go to an area where you're going to fight enemies and take over that area. You're telling the game like the game will tell you ahead of time. Hey, with this unit, you'll do 90 damage. They'll do 10 damage. And then it kind of just plays out like I don't hit a button. It's like chess. I tell it this is the move I'm making. And then it shows me the results and animates it for me. Mm -hmm. But it's a little different because each uh, unit that you fight has its own level of stamina and then you have yours. So if I like, I have a really powerful unit. One of the characters is a level 20. He's my main fighter. He's the fastest and he's the highest level character, but he only has the, the unit only has a level nine state or nine levels of stamina. So that means in battles, he can only fight nine battles. But it doesn't mean it's not like how you would typically think of a game where it's like, well, that means he can beat nine units, right? No, he might fight the same unit six times before he beats them. Hmm. And that drops his stamina down to three. So that means you've got to now manage whether he should be fighting the next unit or you should be bringing in another unit. So there's a lot of... a strategy in it, which is where the Fire Emblem comes in, but it's different strategy. Um, and I think that's why... It's a I didn't 2D think... perspective, right? It's a... It's, so it's it's kind of like that JRPG open world, so you're walking around the world, and then when you get in the fights, it's a 2D perspective in watching them fight back and forth. Interesting. It's very interesting. I think it's a Jesse game. Of course, I would tell you get it on sale. It's on sale right now. It's forty bucks. But I, I would say you've got plenty Deeper to play. Sale. But you, wait for it to be like twenty bucks. Or if you see it on Xbox and you have rewards and it's on sale for thirty bucks and you got twenty thirty dollars in rewards, it I would highly recommend it. I think you'll find the story to be satisfying. I wouldn't say it's super mature like Game of Thrones. It's still got a little bit of a kiddish like Fire Fire Emblemness, yep. but I don't think it's at that level of Nintendo, if you know what I mean. Um, I don't think it's a mature game. I didn't look. It's probably teen, um, but it's definitely got an intriguing plot. I really like the dis- like you can like you can beat a character like a villain. You can either set them free or punish them. And I did a little research and that stuff changes things. And I was like, oh, okay. So these decisions matter. Um, so I'm I'm really enjoying it way more than I thought I would. It's a really That's good it. game. So I'll end it on a game I'm not enjoying that I thought I wouldn't. Well, I shouldn't say not enjoying, but not enjoying as much as I thought I would. And that's Super Mario RPG. Oh. Um, 
I'm about three and a half hours now into it. It's still fun, but it's just, I don't know. It's a little Is dated. it the game itself, or is it the remaster, the quality of the remaster that's turning you off? I think the remaster is fine. I think it's just you have to realize it's an old-ass game. And they didn't go in and go, well, we're going to give Mario depth. And, you know, we're going to give these uh, side characters their own side story. It's very, like, shallow, like... It's a game of its time. Yeah, we took Princess Peach. We got to go get her. And the only thing it is is an RPG, like, combat. But the RPG combat is fun, but not super fun. And there's just, like, little things about it that are strictly from that era of time that are like, oh my gosh, this is more annoying than fun. Um, the good thing is, it is a, excuse me, a shorter experience. So even though it is a JRPG, because it's made by Square, um, it's about 11, 12 hours long. So I think I'll stick with it, because I'm already three and a half hours in. It's something that I can probably knock out if I just keep plucking at it. But if you had to ask me like right now, if you're on your switch between those two games, which one you want, it's not even close. I want to play unicorn overlord. It's way better, way better. Um, those are the only two I'm going to talk about tonight because those are the only ones I really dove into, but I've bought other switch games that I'm real excited to play. I'm going to play at some point, uh, Paper Mario, it's a remake, A Thousand yep. Year Door. Um, looks gorgeous on the OLED Switch. Another good RPG-type game that I'm looking forward to playing. I'm curious to see if you'll have think. a different experience with that as you're having with Mario RPG. I think I think it will be a little bit better. It's not as... It's a 20-year-old game, whereas I think Super Mario RPG it was is a very Super NES game. I would, it's very, it was very kiddie yeah. at the time. So, we'll see. Uh, which, I can get over that. I don't, I'm don't. i not like, why isn't Mario dying? Or, you know, where is <laughs> Lu- why didn't Luigi betray Mario? It's not, it's not that that I have a problem with. It's more of the level design and how I keep running into fucking enemies every five seconds. That's my one F-bomb. Every five seconds when I'm just like, I just want to, you're having me chase this character. First of all, he stole my stuff, which is annoying. I'm trying to chase him, and you keep throwing enemies at me, like distracting me when I'm just trying to get to him. Um, That gets a little annoying, and that's old school, like, let's just throw enemies at you nonstop. Um, But overall, I think it's a good game. I I just think it's, for me personally, it's a seven and a half, eight right now. It's not amazing but it's not bad like if you have nostalgia for it i had nostalgia as far as i bought it when i was younger and i thought it was cool but i never beat it i never played it for a long time that was back in my days when i was a kid where i didn't understand rpgs and they didn't make sense to me because i'm like i understand why i push a button and then i have it's delayed and it just why am i taking turns like i never understood that And I've talked about it before. Like, that was my experience with Coder. I remember reading all these articles about it. Again, not understanding RPGs fully at the time. Oh, you can do bad things. You can do good things. It's in an open world. Oh, this is going to be the ultimate game. And then the first time I play Coder, I'm like, what the hell is this? (laughs) First of all, I can't. I You said I could be evil. I can't punch that guy. I want to punch that guy. And then when I'm fighting, it's like you push a button. Now he swings. And I'm two <laughs> inches away from him and it says miss. I'm like, what? So I wasn't like a fan of those games back then. So there's no nostalgia where I'm like, oh, I just loved JRPGs and I loved everything Square released. And now it's with a Mario twist. I don't I don't have that. My nostalgia was I just thought it was cool because it was Mario. So it's good, but it's not great. It's yeah. a game. You're not a huge Switch guy, and I don't think you're a Mario fanboy. I, I don't. It's not a recommend for you. Yeah, I don't think it would be a game for me. All right, I think that does it. I think it, that's our show. We uh, we gave you our thoughts on Hellblade too. I think it's good. I think it it's deserving of its eighty one. 
I don't think it's deserving of the videos and a lot of the hate I see. Uh, I do think Xbox bias exists. It's real. I don't think I'm an really? Xbox. I just think it exists. Uh, maybe it's Xbox's fault too for that. Um, Star Oceans also recommend. I don't think it's an amazing game, but if you're looking for a cheap JRPG experience that's outside of Final Fantasy, this is a good option. It's fun. Um, yeah, it's a fun game. Combat is definitely fun. And the story and the lore is pretty cool as you dive in. So I'll be interested to see if you stick with it. Um, that's it. And we'll see you next show. Jesse will be back. We will do a Hellblade 2 uh, spoiler cast. That way we will be able to break down all the things that we did not get to talk about tonight. Thanks, guys, for listening. Hope to see you for the next show.